So we're lucky enough living now in 2023 that we're presented not only with traditions, many thousands of year old traditions where people can learn how to meditate and clear their mind, where not only can we get to that place of deep calm, but we can get to a place of total understanding of how our minds work and how believing a thought can cause our suffering. It is the only cause of our suffering, how to get beyond that and live, live a happy, clear life where we can help others get through their suffering. If life is a mystery, who done it? Welcome to Ye Gods. I'm Scott Carter. My guest today is Stephen Mitchell. Though some may admire him most for his poetry, his anthologies, his children's books, or his translations of Beowulf, or the Iliad, or the Odyssey, or the poems of Rilke or Neruda, for me, he's the supreme translator of the world's great spiritual writings into the English language. I first became a fan of his Tao Te Ching in 1995, then his Gospel According to Jesus, and now I have a bookshelf by my bed comprised solely of book CDs and videos by the spiritual <laughs> power couple of Stephen and his wife Byron Katie, author of Loving What Is. For almost 30 years, I've considered Stephen to be my unofficial mentor, and I think of myself as his unmatriculated pupil, and I alone am responsible for my theological errors or my multitude of sins. It is now my honor to say, welcome to ye gods, my friend Stephen Mitchell. Thank you, Scott. That's generous of you. You may say generous, and I would say it, it doesn't begin to describe my aberration for you nor your accomplishments. I want to begin by introducing our listeners to where you're coming from. And it all starts in Brooklyn. You grow up, you're in a Jewish family, but you go to a Catholic school. You go to a religious school. Is that it right? Was actually not Catholic. It was Protestant. And, oh, Protestant. And what And what faith? Well, um, there was a Quaker overtone, but it was basically mainstream Protestant. And there was compulsory chapel every Tuesday. So I, as a little Jewish kid, never having been in a church or never having heard any of this before, was uh, confused, let's say. Our headmaster would recite passages from the Gospels at chapel every Tuesday. And I felt a great attraction for some of the stories, attraction for Jesus in some of the stories. And other stories uh, confused me. And this was a very fertile condition, one might say. Uh, it lasted into my 30s and 40s. And at a certain point after I, I finished my Tao Te Ching and had the leisure to do whatever I wanted after that, I thought I would clarify my confusion for myself, not for any readership, but just for me and spend uh, however long it took to write a book about Jesus and look at all the scholarship, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I did. And actually, there was a point at which, after all the scholarship was absorbed as well as I could, I couldn't proceed with the writing. There was something missing. And at that point, a foundation in San Francisco that I hadn't even been aware of awarded me a prize. It was a king's ransom of $10,000, and I thought, this is my signal. This is my chance to clarify whatever I need to before I could write the book. So I hired an Israeli guide. We went to Galilee, and I hung out at Capernaum and all the places in the Bible, in the New Testament, where I thought I might get a better sense of Jesus, and nothing happened. I spent two weeks there. It was wonderful scenery. My guide was excellent. And I was still baffled as to why I was there. And then he said, why don't I, why don't you let me take you to the Sinai Desert? I spent a couple of years there when it was under Israeli control. It's an amazing place. I said, well, sure, as long as I'm here. And while we were in the Sinai, he hired a Bedouin guide. And uh, the first, oh, half hour that we started trekking into the desert, at a certain point he stopped and he said, I have to pray. You know, this is one of the five times I have to pray. And so he, my Israeli guide and I were sitting on a, a large boulder watching him do his prostrations and say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, God is powerful. And there was such complete and beautiful surrender that I saw in this man's whole body from his 
head to his fingertips, such devotion, such purity in that in those gestures that I had trouble not getting up and bowing with him. Uh, but I was aware that that would freak him out, a, a Jew bowing to Muslim prayers, and it would freak my Israeli friend out even more. So I stayed put. But at that point, I started really paying attention to this man. He was obviously my teacher in a certain way. And the next day, when we were trekking into a a fertile part of the Sinai where he had his garden. He invited me to meet his children, which was a great compliment, my Israeli friend said. So we went in, into his house in his garden and he introduced me to the children. And then we shared our lunch, which was exotic for these little Bedouin kids, like canned tuna fish and stuff like that. And each of them walked up to uh, the Bedouin guide and got a little handful of tuna fish and crackers and whatever else we brought. And then they didn't eat. They sat back down. They were very well behaved. And as as this was happening, I was watching with some kind of amazement because I had never seen such respect and honoring for a parent in American kids. Uh, in all my experience, there was, there was great humor between them, but there was also this kind of awe that they had of the father. And I... I was aware at that point that what was missing in me was a, a deep understanding of what Jesus meant by Father or Abba. I had my experience of what this archetypal patriarchal father was for the children. He was the fountain of all generosity, the, the, the giver of all good things in life. That's their experience. It was very clear to me. And that's what Jesus meant by Father. You know, if we strip the word patriarch of all its current meanings and go back to that ancient figure of power and generosity and goodness, that's what I needed to understand in order to write the book. So when I got back from the Sinai, I started writing and it all opened up effortlessly. But I want to go back to you as a young student hearing about Jesus for the first time. You said that some of Jesus' tales about him or words of some confused you and some inspired you. Mm. What, what kind of religion was there in your household mm. growing up? Well, we, my parents were Reformed Jews. Actually, my mother more than my father. My father was a doctor and didn't really uh, have much patience for any kind of religion. But we, we didn't light candles on the Sabbath. We didn't, my parents never mentioned God. Um, we went to synagogue twice a year on the High Holy Days. So it was a cultural and um, ethnic Judaism and not much religion. As a matter of fact, my beloved grandfather, who was also a doctor, was um, a great skeptic in all these matters. One of his pet peeves was the Holy Ghost. He would say to my grandma, I just had another discussion with Father O'Connor at the hospital, the Catholic chaplain. My, my grandfather was a surgeon. And he said, he would th say things like, Oh, he explained God the Father, and he explained God the Son, but when it came to God the Holy Ghost, he was as clear as mud. And my, my grandfather just loved to uh, to tweak that kind of thing, and my father was just couldn't care less about it. My mother had some loyalty to being Jewish, but not, not with any religious overtones. So that's how I grew up. So you're not getting a lot of religion at home, and then you're hearing about Jesus, which is new to you at the time. How does what became your life's work begin to emerge within you? Well, there's a very clear point, and that point was in January of 1965 when I was 22, and my first girlfriend ever, we were together for two years, I had met her in France, uh, broke up with me. That was the point the the point the first point of really deep suffering in my life and uh, it, there was a low key heartache with her for 18 years after she broke up with me it was just how i lived it was uh, something i i didn't know how to get over especially for the first year and what happened you know many many people go through heartbreaks when when they're young adults and somehow get over it and get on with their lives. I couldn't uh, for some reason. So I started to read in the Bible 
because I didn't know anything about, I wasn't, had no awareness of Buddhism or Taoism or anything but Judaism and Christianity. So I started to read in the Bible. I thought, you know, there's got to be some place in the Bible which will help me deal with this pain in my heart. And what I discovered was the book of Job. That This was the first main thing that I ever really worked on. When I, I read the book of Job over and over in the King James Version, and I read it over and over because I heard at the end of the book of Job in this section that's called The Voice from the Whirlwind, what I heard through that book was something, I thought that whoever, whatever poet wrote that ancient text had seen something important about life and suffering, and that if I could understand what that magnificent climax to the book of Job, the answer of, of all of Job's heartbroken questions, that, 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 that there was a real answer there that no biblical scholar or theologian had figured out before. They all talked of it in terms of brute power, that finally God comes and says, what do you know, you little worm of a human being? You, you better submit to me. And Job says, yes, sir, yes, boss, you know. And it's a pretty feeble ending to to what I felt was a magnificent poem. So I felt that there had to be something else going on there. And so uh, after reading through the book of Job a couple of dozen times over the months, I decided that I had better learn Hebrew so I could get more intimate with that text. The Hebrew that I had learned for my bar mitzvah as a young boy had dribbled away after a year or less. So, so I learned Hebrew, and I once I began to read the book of Job in Hebrew, I discovered that I had to learn biblical scholarship and ancient Near Eastern comparative philology because the text is a bit of a mess. But I, so I learned those, and I worked at the book of Job. I, I started to translate it to get closer to it. It's written in verse, and nobody had translated it into verse in any other language before I got to it. But I felt that the power of the book consisted in its compression and its beauty, the beauty of the language. So I was translating it into verse. Fast forward six years, I got to a point where I had a, a, a pretty good version to my inner ear, but I still didn't understand what it was that I had heard at the center of that book, that, that insight into life, that secret of life solved. So I decided that I had better meet somebody who had embodied it in the flesh. I was I started to learn Hindi. I was going to go to India to meet a teacher. And instead, I met a Zen master in Providence, Rhode Island, and stayed with him. And after a year of very intensive Zen training, I understood what was the secret at the center of the Book of Job. And everything opened up for me. And this, most of the suffering was over, and uh, I proceeded with my Zen practice to de deepen that insight. So my girlfriend in my life, my first girlfriend, was the great bodhisattva that got me started on the path. And 18 years later, actually, after my first, after my selected Rilke came out, I sent her a copy, not expecting to hear an answer from her. And she sent me a beautiful letter, very warm. We met in New York, and it was just an amazing uh, closing of that circle. I think that Zen is one of the most misunderstood words by people. And when people hear it, they often think of people being passive or they think of placid settings. But I have heard you talk about, and I've also read where you, you talk about the arduous training. Well, yes, that's correct. I wanted to embody the Buddha's third noble truth, which is the end of suffering in myself. And, you know, there were big chunks of suffering I resolved through the practice. And the, basically, it's a practice of kind of like tenderizing, like you're the meat and reality is the mallet, you know. I was so hungry for understanding that I was willing to do anything reasonable in, in Zen terms. And so, you know, in addition to the group retreats that I did, I think it was in those years, it, I did a total of 53 seven-day intensive group retreats for 12 hours of meditation a day. But I wanted more 
So I did six 30-day solitary retreats, two 100-day solitary retreats with 20 hours of meditation a day, and one brutal seven-day bowing retreat, which involved 5,000 full prostrations a day. And it was a killer. It was the most pain, physically painful thing I ever did. So when you're finishing, let's say, the two 100-day vigils, are you feeling exhilarated by this? Yeah. So by the end of both re, both 100-day retreats, I was feeling an immense exhilaration. And I think uh, a f- further degree of clarity in my practice. So I'm very glad that I did them, but they were not easy to do. Our mutual friend, Sam Harris, who identifies himself as, he's a neuroscientist, but also identifies himself as an atheist, has written and talked about, when I've had him as a guest, about a time in his 20s when he did hallucinogenics with a friend and how what that experience told him is that Buddha and Jesus and other prophets are not shams, and it convinced him that they had some treasures of wisdom worth pursuing, but that the religions that may have formed around them or other prophets are, I think he compared it to the rubbles of a ruin, of a, of a once great building. Mm-hmm. If people, I, I don't know if you've ever done hallucinogenics, I have. Would you consider that to be a less arduous shortcut to some of the insights that you received by spending a hundred days silently by yourself? There's no way I can compare them. I just wouldn't know. But as for religions, yeah, I think I would probably agree with Sam in, in most ways. What attracted me to Zen in particular was its use of doubt as a, as a tool toward clarity. Everything was about uh, was co- to be called into question. There was no religion left after you questioned it the way that the Zen people did. So when I first began to practice Zen meditation, my teacher said, you know, there are two important things here. One is great doubt. You, you have to put everything that goes on in your mind uh, under the microscope and not accept it on the surface because... Um, in a, even in a retreat setting, the most magnificent vision, like a vision of uh, visions of Saint Teresa, or you know, the greatest, most spectacular truths that are conveyed to you, are equal to pain in the leg or remembering some anger that you had at your mother when you were five years old. It's all mind stuff. It's all external to what you're looking for. So that was great doubt. And and koan practice, in particular, is a way of entering a state of doubting of everything, of every reality. And then he said, you also have to have great faith at the same time in faith in the practice that eventually it will give you the end of suffering and the kind of serenity that the Buddha entered. So, yeah, I was, I was very um, attracted to the cleanness and simplicity and really nothingness of, of Zen as an institution, as a practice, where everything disappears except, um, except the essential. I love Stephen's emphasis on a practice like Zen as a necessary component of faith. He believes that we have to have faith and at the same time have faith in practice if we are to, in time, experience an end of suffering. On the other side of this break, we'll discuss some of history's greatest writers and critical thinkers who, like Stephen, have deeply examined the Gospels to discover what Jesus most likely said and perhaps did not. That's coming up. Whenever I read or listen to any of your work, I have a complete intellectual embrace of the peace you promise and the path you offer. And yet I know also, and I've been following you for 30 years, I know also there are times where my intentions don't make it to the goal line. 
that it's like an addict who knows that their habits are going to doom them yeah. and yet can't break those habits. Mm. Uh, and one figure who comes to my mind, who I know you admire the writing of, nobody tried to be a better person than Leo Tolstoy. And yet there are so many ways in which he fell short with his family, with his uh, treatment of, of the former serfs who were then liberated by the Tsar, not by Tolstoy, uh, and who w then worked for them, for him. And he never lost his anger. He uh, was impatient with everyone else and ended on such a sad note that he abandoned his family in the middle of the night with one of his daughters at the age of 83. He goes yeah. to a monastery. They will not allow him in. Uh, he's still persona non grata, even though he's dead 100 years. And then he gets sick. He's on a railway car, third class, because he doesn't want to be seen as a nobleman and gets sick. And they stop the train at, at a train station, and that's where he dies. Or Jefferson, that he's a slave owner, it, as were many founding fathers. It's the original sin of America. And yet I love so much of his writing and his Bible that you begin your introduction to the gospel according to Jesus by citing Jefferson. Yeah, he and, was my inspiration. And the task he performed twice mm -hmm. in his life of going through the four gospels and reducing it to only the ones he thought were valid and getting rid of everything else and making them into one narrative. Yeah. But what I want to get to is... Um, and I mentioned to you before we started taping, that doing this podcast, I feel, is shifting me in some ways, or I'm having to think about new things based upon things that either my guests say or things that my listeners are saying. And one of the things that Jefferson was very keen to in deciding on this gospel, and also something Tolstoy was keen to in, in the gospel that he fashioned for himself decades and decades after Jefferson had died, is the notion of scriptural corruption, that not all of the lines that are attributed to Jesus in the Gospels as they exist for most people, that Jefferson was one of the first that, that I read about who's saying a lot of this is not Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, there are two examples that Tolstoy cites that are in the play that I wrote about the two of them and, and Charles Dickens, three people who wrote about the Gospels is that Tolstoy talks about in the five new commandments that Tolstoy presents in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about Jesus saying, in days of old, it was, it was told to you not to kill, and I say to you not to be angry with your brother without a cause. What Tolstoy contends is the phrase without a cause. Mm -hmm. Because whenever anybody is angry, they think they have a cause. Sure. That in the days before Gutenberg... Bibles were copied one at a time by some lowly anonymous priest sitting in a cell, and some of them added in their own thoughts or took out some of the radical notions of Jesus with which they did not agree, though they call him God. Well, I think, yeah, I, that's correct, but I think it's even more radical than that. And this is a, a very complex subject, and I don't think we want to go too deeply into it. But at the point of writing is where a lot of the a lot of the um, fudging came in. Not later on over the centuries when the scribes were were copying the book, but when it was written, there were many stories about Jesus. It was, you know, the the earliest Gospel of Mark was was written in about seventy of the Common Era. So that was already 40 years after Jesus died. In an oral culture, there were all sorts of stories circulating about Jesus, and the gospel writers were there to, to pick, and sometimes their choices were pretty poor. So, yeah, and getting back to the subject of Tolstoy and how miserably his life ended, and there are people who have very deep insight into things like Tolstoy. I think he was the greatest, by far the greatest novelist ever. And his insights about Jesus were were true and, and deep. I think also of Rilke, who understood so much, so deeply about life and was not a happy human being. One of the things that was not present in their lives was a, a practice, a way to help them beyond their uh, personalities so that they could get clearer and become more uh, able to live 
what they had understood in all aspects of their lives. So we're lucky enough living now in 2023 that we're presented not only with traditions thousand year many thousands of year old traditions where people can learn how to meditate and clear their mind and get to a very deep place of calm but also we have available to us this incredibly powerful method that Katie has discovered the work where not only can we get to that place of deep calm but we can get to a place of total understanding of how our minds work and how believing a thought can cause our suffering it is the only cause of our suffering how to get beyond that and live, live a happy clear life where we can help others get through their suffering i i want to confess that i think i can also overdo my notions of scriptural corruption to dismiss anything that i read in the gospels with which i do not agree Mm. Yeah, that can happen too. And, you know, we just come back to our open mind and see if something can be helpful. You know, when I was putting together the gospel according to Jesus, and I said this explicitly in the introduction, I tried to err on the sen in the sense of exclusion. Because there were a number of, of verses, you know, I was putting together whatever I felt was authentically went back to Jesus himself, the historical Jesus. And my intuitive sense through my practice turned out to be uh, consistent with a scholarly sense. There's a group of scholars called, the, what were they called? The Jesus, Jesus Seminar. Seminar. Yeah. So they their choices based on purely scholarly intellectual criteria were fairly consistent with my intuitive choices. But there were certain things one, I, I can talk about one in particular that, that seemed probable that they went back to Jesus, but I couldn't justify them in my mind as, some, as something that an intelligent, um, understanding person would be saying, like, there is no divorce. You cannot get divorced. And I, I really spent a lot of time with that, days, maybe even weeks, trying to see how that could be a reasonable, compassionate policy, and I couldn't. I couldn't find it. As a matter of fact, there were at the time, shortly before the time of Jesus, there were two main schools of, of Jewish learning and jurisprudence. One was the school of Shammai, one was the school of Hillel. Hillel was the more liberal one, and the school of Shammai was very tough about divorce. The school of Hillel was completely open to that, and not only open, but encouraged it in this sense. They said, even if a husband wants to divorce his wife because she's burnt his dinner, he should be allowed to do that. Now that seems, you know, on the surface of it, it seems a little crazy. But their attitude was, if a husband is so benighted and and narrow-minded and um, ugly about something as trivial as a wife burning his dinner, they shouldn't be married. It wouldn't be a kindness to the wife. So I didn't put that saying of Jesus about divorce in, not because I didn't think it was historical, because possibly or probably it does go back to him, but I couldn't understand how anyone with Jesus' uh, deep compassion and awareness could be saying that. In the Jesus Seminar Book of the Gospels, they not only evaluate the four Gospels, but also the Book of Thomas, mm -hmm. but in their listing of what they think is most probable that is accurate and true than Jesus said. They only have two words from the book of Thomas, but I love them. It's Jesus just saying to people, be passers-by. Mm, good advice. And one of the comments that Tolstoy had about the assembling of the Bible as we know it is that one of the problems that the people who decided on what was in and what was out was, if there was a book that they wanted in, they said everything about it is perfect and true. And if there was a book they decided not to be in, they said nothing in it can be true. Hmm. And he thought that was a huge, huge error. The other thing I want to get to that you explore, so, it's so interesting to me, your emphasis upon the childhood that Jesus must have had. You make a comment that even if the angel has spoken to Mary, the angel didn't go around to the other people in the village and explain to them 
Yeah. That this was a divine event that they should respect and that in a village at the time with the level of ignorance, uh, with how people naturally are, he likely grew up in a childhood with a great deal of shame. Yeah. That was a thing about the other villagers was a wonderful quote from Kierkegaard. I talked about this in the book in the introduction. There's some evidence that Jesus was an Ill illegitimate child. This is speculation because there's no way to prove it. But I wanted to pursue that a little bit because to me, it made me understand certain things about Jesus that I wouldn't have without this speculation. But Really, there's no way to know. the Bible. There's so much opposite conflicting information about Jesus in the official Gospels that you really can't make a biography of him. But I thought it was useful to speculate because even as for Kierkegaard, a devout Christian would be able to agree with how he grew up because the angel if there was an angel, wouldn't have told anyone but Mary. So even if you don't believe in the virginal conception, or if you do believe, it's the same situation about a kid growing up with a mother whose reputation was doubtful because she was pregnant without a father. So any, any even a fundamentalist Christian would understand this. And uh, to me, that explained something about Jesus's overwhelming sympathy and attraction for the rejects of society, the prostitutes, the poor, and the wicked. At the time, the category of wicked wasn't something that we would use about, oh, I'm a sinner too, you know, I, I'm not loving enough toward my children, et cetera, et cetera. No, the wicked were people who, like the tax collectors, were collaborating with the Roman oppressors. And it was like collaborators during World War II. This was really serious and extremely harmful to most of the people. So he was, he felt that his message was most crucial towards the people who needed it the most. The healthy don't need a physician, he said. And this is ra radical enough so that most people who even even devout Christians don't understand how offensive this would have been to the normal Jewish population of the time who were suffering under Roman domination. So his love for all of humanity was a touchstone of, of, of who he was, of what, what he was what he was teaching, what he was what he was all about. And uh, it's more radical than most people can imagine. Another aspect of this upbringing that you delve into is, I mean, one comment that I've heard from some people who reject Jesus is he's cruel sometimes to his family, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of anger in him. There's often times that he is prickly, like when he's hungry, comes upon a fig tree, it is bearing no fruit, and so he condemns it. <laughs> Isn't that stupid? <laughs> Th this, this, this context that you set him in explains a lot of that to me. Well, you know, I, I talk at, at some length in the introduction about his attitude towards his family, and that is information that I believe is absolutely genuine, because there's a when you have something appear in a holy text that's trying to paint a, a character as holy as as a prophet and then there's evidence of something to the contrary you can be pretty sure that that evidence is historical because the writers would have not wanted to include it if they didn't believe that it was true on the other hand the story about the fig tree and a lot of the angry diatribes against the the pharisees it's not the same thing the family stuff i feel is very genuine and really important to understand all of the or most of the other stuff the angry diatribes were placed in the gospels decades after jesus died when the controversy between judaism and the early church was raging and the pharisees quite rightly according to their beliefs were rejecting jesus because they didn't believe that any corpse could be brought back to life for one thing you know, and, and they felt that at the heart of Christianity was a big lie. Nobody is resurrected. So there was a great struggle between the Jews and the Jewish church and a lot of anger. And these gospel writers were, retro, the, the term is retroject. They were retrojecting this anger of Jesus at the Pharisees 
from their own current difficulties with the Pharisees. So all of that stuff is later, in my opinion, added by the early church. But the uh, the rudeness toward his mother and the family's fear that Jesus had gone crazy from what they were hearing about him, that I think is genuine. And it's and it's it's very natural and human and understandable, I think. Yeah. A prophet is not uh, listened to in his own town by his own family. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I found some wonderful quotations from um, an ancient Chinese Zen master who says the same thing. So, you know, they, he would never have been, he would never have heard the Gospels. This is a human situation that people who knew you as a, as a kid with your family problems and your wildness or whatever, or your goodness, whatever. And then you've had this major transformation as an adult and come back to your family. They don't necessarily see how you've changed. I am so grateful for this time. There are a couple of more things that I would like to ask you about very quickly. And I'm 71. You turned 80 this year. Yes, sir. As you age, do you find yourself thinking more of death? I've been reading a lot of Shakespeare lately, and he has the character of Prospero at the end of The Tempest, who's about 45, as Shakespeare was at the time, and he says, from now on, every third thought shall be my grave. Hmm. And, and do you think about death? Do you believe in an afterlife? Well, my Zen training was in don't know mind. Don't know mind is eternal life. So I don't spend any energy thinking about death or afterlife, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm open to it. I, if I had to uh, say anything, I would go back to what Katie says, God is everything, God is good. So whatever the experience is going to be or the non-experience is going to be, um, I look forward to it. I love to sleep. Nothing going on in sleep. I don't dream. It's a very wonderful experience. And it's it's a, an experience, you could say it's an experience of non-being, but everybody looks forward to it. And if we don't have enough of it, we go crazy. So uh, that's an analogy that seems seems appropriate. But um, no, I, I don't have every third thought about death or even one millionth thought about death. I just try to be present to the best of my ability. A couple of questions that I ask everybody. Is there, when you have times of stress, and I know you they don't come often to you, is there a single quote that provides special comfort to you? No. <laughs> if, if there's any stress, I uh, uh, try to collect myself and, and question the thought that's causing the stress. And um, yeah, just to live the don't know is my practice. And then the other question that I ask everybody is, if there were one work of art or one experience that you wish that everybody of their own volition could partake of that you think would be beneficial for them, not, not your own work or Katie's, uh, what, uh -oh. would that, what, would, what would that be? Oh, well, I'm going to eliminate all of the spiritual texts that I would point people to. A purely work of art. Gee, you could do a lot worse than War and Peace. War and Peace is, uh, I just, I've, I've read, I think, three times. First time on the Trans-Siberian Railroad heading east. Oh. And in 2011, I spent the whole year studying, go, going back over the book, a new translation, and then also every form that it's taken so that there was a Hollywood movie in 1957, that great Russian epic in 68, uh, there have been BBC radio dramas of it. But also what interests me, a way that I think of you as I think of Tolstoy, is that your translations are more than translations in the same way that as he went from War and Peace to Anna Karenina, Karenina and beyond, he kind of outgrew the restrictions of the novel and just wanted to talk directly and mm -hmm. bring the truth of his own experience to his readers. Mm -hmm. Stephen, it is such a delight to talk to you, and I thank you for being so generous with your time, and I look forward to a future conversation with Katie 
and I look forward to whatever writing next. And in researching, I think there are some a couple of books of yours that I have not already gone through, so I now want to order those oh. so that I have a sense of, of, of completely knowing your work. But I thank you so much, Stephen Mitchell. You're very welcome, Scott. It was a pleasure. And now for my sermonette, In My Homily Opinion. I'm no scholar. I dropped out of college for a career in the theater that did not pan out, at least not then. Some, such as Stephen Mitchell, have an encyclopedic grasp of history. Mine is Wikipedic. When I was growing up, I was taught that the great library at Alexandria was accidentally burned by Julius Caesar's soldiers. And once I remember asking Stephen, if you could have been there through time travel, which of the 40,000 scrolls that were lost would you have tried to say? And he said, Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher. But as I was checking the year of that fire, I read that, yes, there was a blaze in 48 BC, and some books were burned, but not all or even most. Scholars now think that the library's decline was gradual. Rulers became apathetic to raising taxes to allocate funds to preserve the knowledge of our species. So the great library went down, not with a bang, but with a whimper. The sixth U.S. president, John Quincy Adams, once wrote, I am a warrior so that my son may be a merchant, so that his son may be a poet. Well, with a volunteer army, few Americans are warriors, and the merchant class has been gobbled up by massive big box chains. Modern appliances and digital devices have relieved most of us from the back-breaking labor that once consumed Americans' waking hours. We have more discretionary time than our ancestors, but how many of us are poets? How do we use this gift of time? Time, once a luxury, is now a commodity to pass, to kill. How could distracting ourselves be life's purpose? Living poet Stephen Mitchell has spent a career pursuing life's meaning as taught by history's great spiritual practices. His is a hero's journey, which ends with the presenting of an elixir, a blessing to the world. His gift to the world are his works, which distill his long-sought and gained wisdom. He's walked a walk that we may read. Books are available on so many platforms these days, so open one or listen to one. That's our show for today. You can email us at yegodspodcast at gmail.com or connect to us on social media at yegodspodcast. And until next time, be of good cheer. Mm-hmm.